pick up about verse 14, Ephesians chapter 3. If you remember uh, last week, uh, the beginning of chapter 3, the first half of chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about his stewardship. He's talking about how, uh, you know, he, he still couldn't fathom uh, that, that God had chose him to be a steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we learned about uh, the manifold uh, wisdom of God, which is now made known through the church, the mystery, the great mystery that uh, man has longed to know uh, for, for, for many few, uh, previous generations. Um, and so we, we learn about the mystery of Christ. And, and so he's in this part of the, of the scriptures in chapter three, he's more or less, he's just trying to kind of set the stage for the next chapter which is going to talk about the, the Christian's walk and how we are to have unity um, and that the, 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 the Ephesians, whether it be the Gentiles along with the, the Jewish converts, and he, you know, he's, he's calling for unity within the, the, the church. And he's also calling for the, the Ephesians, or really the, the Gentile converts to Christianity to step up. And so let's look at what it says now. You're going to see the second half of, of chapter three, it, uh, Paul closes out the, the chapter with a prayer. And in starting, he starts that prayer in verse 14. And notice what it says. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. Let's just go ahead and read through the end of the chapter, and then we're going to go back and discuss it so we can hear the prayer as a whole. And then it goes on to say in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may, fill, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so when you look at um, the, chapter, the second half of chapter 3 there, verses 14 uh, through the end of that chapter, uh, the, verse 21, you see that that's Paul's prayer for the church. And so notice now when you get to verses 14 and 15, the emphasis in those two verses, if we read those again, 14 and 15, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And brethren, that's so very important that you understand those two verses at the beginning of Paul's prayer, because Paul's emphasis is on the total fatherhood of God, and it's closely connected to the preceding verse that we've seen in verse 9, because in verse 9 of, the, uh, of, of, of chapter 3, notice that it says, and to bring to light that which, that which is the ministration of the mystery, which for the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. And so we see uh, the fatherhood of God because he is the God of creation. And so it's, important, it's an important concept to grasp because one of the, uh, the greatest questions that we, as we talk to our friends and family and neighbors, one of the greatest questions that we could ask ourselves is simply, is there a God? Did we evolve over multiplied billions of years? Or is there an actual God who created us? Because if the answer is yes, there's a God who created us, well, then that changes everything. And so in these two verses, Paul, he's praying. Uh, he says that he goes, I bow my knees to the Father in whom every family in heaven, on earth, in, in heaven and on earth has derived its name. And so it's so very important that we understand the, the fatherhood concept of God as his creation. And then in verse 16, notice what it says. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit and the inner man. You know, when you get to verse 16, it's important to understand that in the Old Testament times, uh, God strengthened the outer man. But in the New Testament time, he strengthens the inner man. And, and really, what do we mean by that? Because uh, when you get to verse 16, it talks about how uh, he's praying that, that these Ephesian uh, uh, Christians would be strengthened with power through his through the Holy Spirit and the inner man. And so to give an example of this, uh, when we see how God worked through kind of the outer man, two examples of that would be Gideon and uh, Samson. Those are the two that kind of readily come to mind. And when you think of Gideon and when you think of Samson, uh, remember in Gideon, uh, 
the Holy Spirit took possession of this of this man who was um, who 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 just thought so little of himself. Uh, he was weak. He was fearful. Uh, he said, "Why would you want me? Why would you choose me?" And so, uh, so the Holy Spirit took possession, so to speak, of Gideon, and meaning that he gave him the power that he would need, the confidence that he would need, in order to bring about all that God was going to have Gideon to do. And we know that uh, that Gideon and the, it was the Holy Spirit working through Gideon, uh, and, and the plan that they had in place destroyed a force of 120,000 Midianites. It tells us in um, in Judges chapter six and Judges chapter eight. And so really those six, seven, and eight, you can read that story. Uh, also, God, through the outer man, was working through Samson. And he was, uh, it was the Holy Spirit that was working through Samson that gave him that unbelievable strength that he would have had in order to conquer God's uh, enemies, in order to do the things that we read about uh, when we read the stories of Samson and the chronicles of Samson, if you will. And so now we get to the New Testament, and we see here uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, and we see in these verses, and especially verse 16, it talks about how Paul is praying that God will strengthen the inner man. And so in the New Testament times, God strengthens the inner man, our inner man, talking about our soul, our spirits, our mind, our heart. Because in the Christian era, the Holy Spirit works would be more of a spiritual work and not so much a physical work as many of the works were be uh, were physical in nature, uh, going through thousands of, of years and, and, and multiplied generations uh, through the nation of Israel. And so we did see in the first century how the power of the Holy Spirit was working in miraculous ways. And so there we've seen the, uh, the outward manifestation of the power of God through the Holy Spirit working through, through man. But we also know that the, the bulk of the work that the Holy Spirit was going to do in the New Testament was going to be on the inner man. Uh, talking about our, our our soul and our spirit and our mind, and so really, it's because in the, in this era that God is going to now reveal to man uh, his the manifold wisdom that it says, and really in, in chapter three and in verse ten, where it says, in, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and to the authorities, and also in the heavenly places, and so those on earth and in the spiritual realm, and so. When you look at this, Paul desires that the Ephesians uh, are to be strengthened so that they could be fulfilled, so they could fulfill their various uh, responsibilities that God had given all disciples of Christ. And so remember what the Apostle Paul said to the people of Coloss. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 through 12, remember what Paul wrote to the people of Coloss. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Notice what he's praying for there. He's praying for them to be built up and to be strengthened in their inner man. Because he's, he's praying that, uh, he's asking that they be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. But what's the point of that knowledge? Well, it tells us in verse 10. In verse 10 through 12 of Colossians chapter 1, it says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So what's the purpose of that knowledge? What's the purpose of the manifold wisdom of God that is, made, that is being made known to the world through the church and through the disciples of Christ? It's so that we know how to walk in a manner that is worthy to the Lord. And it goes on in verse 10, and it says, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness, patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You see, brethren, what the Apostle Paul wrote to the people of Colossus is very similar to what he's praying for here as we see his prayer as he ends this third chapter. And so we need to also uh, to, to look at this from the standpoint that we need to educate ourselves in the Word of God. And so how do we, how do we uh, have the Holy Spirit to work within us? We continue to fill our hearts and our minds with God's word and his moral standard, his moral absolutes. And we allow those to guide us in all things life. So that way, just like he writes uh, to the people of Colossus in that uh, Colossus chapter 1 and verse 10 there, that we will bear fruit. And we will bear fruit in every good work that we do, always increasing in the knowledge of God and in Christ. And we don't hoard that information away. 
We're supposed to take that message out to the world. We're supposed to share it. I shared something on Facebook today, and you know, I haven't really been on Facebook a whole lot, you know, you know, for a while. And but I shared a few things today, and that I seen. And one of them was, um, are you, was is the church founded in Christ? And then it gives the list of all the various uh, man-made denominations and who their founders were. And somebody put on there, said that you know, basically said something to the effect that uh, I like this, but I'm sure it's not going to uh, you know bring you any make you any friends. And I simply said that, yes, you're correct, but we are called to share the truth. And whether we have to take the heat for sharing the truth, we do so, and we share it anyways, and love it with gentleness. And so, brothers and sisters, the truth will bring, uh, will bring about the worst in those, those people in the world, and some of the people of the world. You see, because light exposes darkness, and darkness doesn't like to be exposed. And so we need to increase in, in our knowledge of God continuously. So that way, not only do we educate ourselves in the Lord, we can know how we are to walk in a manner that is pleasing in God's sight while we are here as aliens on this planet. While educating ourselves in Christ, also remember that in Christ, we are to make sure that we conduct ourselves in a manner that pleases God. And we will find peace in Christ Jesus. We'll find comfort in Jesus in our hour of distress, whether it be health calamities, uh, whether it be the storms of life, we need to realize that our peace and our comfort and our joy comes from our relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus. And with the knowledge that we uh, have a place that Jesus went to prepare for us. And so, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what this world throws at us. We know that our joy is wrapped up in Christ and in his, uh, his ability to do all that he says he will do. And then you get to verse 17 of chapter 3 of Ephesians. And then this prayer continues. It says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love. You know, I don't want to pass by verse 17 without really realizing uh, the choice of words that the Apostle Paul uses as he's saying this prayer to close out chapter 3. In verse 17, at the end of verse 17, he uses the words rooted and grounded. And when he uses those words, rooted means like a tree, for example. A tree establish, establishes its, its, its vast root system. And that root system uh, draws the nutrients of the earth and the moisture, and, 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 it, and it, it feeds the tree. But it also gives that tree its stability. And it's kind of like he uses the word grounded. And, and grounded is talking about as a, as a building is stable if it has a solid foundation. So that makes me think of what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 7. You remember the parable of the two foundations? Jesus said, therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and they slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. For everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. You know, the rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Brothers and sisters, in every generation, the wise men, the wise men and women are the individuals who hear God's instruction and act upon them. The instructions in the, in the word of God do us zero good, does us no good if we're not willing to act upon the information that we receive. If we realize that we have some, uh, some shortcomings as we study through the word of God, and if we have some uh, deficiencies in our character, if you will, and yet we don't make the necessary uh, changes to approve upon that. Well, then, brethren, it, it does us no good. It's useless. Our faith is useless. And so we need to be like the wise men in every generation. The wise men are always the individuals who've heard the word of God, who have understood it, and who have uh, made application, proper application, and applied it to their lives. And so, brothers and sisters, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we wise? Or are we foolish? And that's the, really the question that we have to ask ourselves. When you look at verse 18 and 19, notice what it says here. May be able to comprehend with all the saints, that is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. You know, when you look at verses 18 and 19 there, nothing but the true understanding of the love of Christ will cause us to live a life of self-denial for the kingdom of God's sake. I'm going to say that one more time. Nothing but true understanding of the love of Christ 
will cause us to live a life of self-denial. Because if you don't know who you are in Christ, and you don't know all that you have been, that you have been blessed with in Christ, and you don't know all that you've received as far as his eternal blessings, uh, the, the remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, a, 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 a seat at the table in the heavenly kingdom, a place prepared, then brethren, if you don't fully understand who you are in Christ and all that you've received from God, then you're not going to live a life of self-denial. It just isn't going to happen. You'll always find an excuse or a reason why you're not going to uh, do what God really wants you to do. I mean, nothing but true understanding of the love of Christ will, uh, will cause you to also uh, live a life that's benevolent, a life that is willing to give up what the world calls pleasure in order to, to be an individual who looks to serve others. And it all ends and begins with realizing who we are in Christ and that deep abiding love that Christ has for his creation. And so we must continuously strive, brothers and sisters, to have a better understanding of God and all of his expectations that he has for his creation. And then you get to verse 20 and 21 as we look at the end of this uh, prayer and the end of this chapter. And it says, Now to him, meaning God, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And he says, Amen. You know, in verse 21, we find the purpose of the church. We find the purpose of Christians. And our purpose is to glorify God, plain and simple. Our purpose each and every day is to wake up and to find a way that we can glorify our God, our Creator, our Father. And now we get to chapter 4 as we continue through this study. And chapter 4 marks a, a major turning point in this letter. Paul now leaves the grand idea and theology of, of how God gives salvation to take up the teaching in this letter now, uh, the teaching of the Ephesian congregation and all future generations of Christianity um, to take up the practical application of how we live it. So we've seen in the previous chapters uh, how God gives salvation, and now we're going to start to see in chapter 4 how we are to make sure that we as Christians live out our Christianity. And so there, notice what it says in these first three verses, and you'll understand what I mean. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. You see, my opening, what I said there about how we, we the chapter four is about how we make application of how we are to live out our salvation. And then right there in the very first verse, it says, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. And he goes on to say, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, be, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So how well do we do in regards to walking in humility? How well do we do in regards to walking with humility and gentleness, walking with patience? And this thing called life, I mean, right now in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, in the midst of um, uh, everything that is going on from wildfires to hurricanes to pandemics uh, to social and political unrest. Uh, I mean, there's so much to just anger and hate and animosity, it seems to be, in society. So how well are you doing in your walk with Christ? You see, because these instructions don't come uh, to us only in the good days. It doesn't say, well, hey, when things are going great, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. No, brothers and sisters, I've often said that to be a Christian on the good days, anybody can be a Christian on the good days. When your marriage is strong and the kids are obeying and uh, you know, you're financially in a, in a sound place, uh, your health is good, uh, you, you've been blessed materially. I mean, anybody can be a Christian when all is well in all aspects of life. But it's how we conduct ourselves. It's the manner in which we walk. That is so very important when life isn't going well, when things aren't going to plan, when things seem to be in disarray. Brethren, how well do you walk in regards to humility and gentleness in the midst of all that we've seen in 2020? Are you walking with patience? Are you showing tolerance uh, with, to one another in love? Remember what Peter tells us uh, in his letters. We are called out of darkness, he tells us. We are called to follow in Christ's footsteps. We are called to return good 
and not to return evil. For God has called us to his eternal glory. Never forget that Romans chapter 12 teaches us that we are not to, uh, we are not to seek out our own vengeance, our own revenge. We are to leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is his, and he will repay, the scriptures tell us in Romans chapter 12. And that's very similar to what Paul told the people of Rome, to what Peter is telling us in his letters. Because Peter's letters were written in a time when the church was being severely persecuted. And, and, and Nero and others were uh, persecuting the church to the, to the point of putting Christians to death, horrible, uh, um, uh, torturous type deaths. And so we are called, we need to understand we are called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. We need to realize that we are called to follow in Christ's footsteps because we are a people that are supposed to live our lives worthy of the, of, of the calling of God, but in a manner that is holy, for God is holy. Never forget in Jude 1, it also reminds us that we are to be sanctified. And we are to be preserved uh, or, or, or uh, preserved and called as God's people. For Paul instructs us, brothers and sisters, to be diligent in preserving unity. And when you think about preserving unity, how does one preserve unity in the times of, of, of unrest that we see in 2020? Well, you need to change your mindset. You need to change your attitude. You need to make sure that at, at, at the heart of your mindset, at the heart of your attitude, people can see the humility that resides within you. They can see meekness, long-suffering, patience, if you will, forgiving one another. In order to preserve unity, love is a necessary ingredient. So the question I ask for you in this lesson here tonight is, how are you doing in your walk with Christ? In 2020, when things seem to be upside down, when things seem to be in chaos and disarray, and it seems to be like so many people think the world is going to come to an end soon, and you hear these things in various uh, uh, blogs, as I, as I preached on this past week about premillennialism, we talked about the rapture and those things that are, that are starting to be more commonplace in conversations, because all that is going on around the world. And I ask you, how are you doing in your walk? Are you walking with humility and meekness and long-suffering and forgiving one another? Is love at the heart of your mindset and your attitude? Because love is the necessary ingredient that binds all of us together in, in, in a mindset of unity. And so now we get to this next section of Scripture in verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians chapter 4. And the Apostle Paul, he tells us that God's great example of unity can be seen in the church. And we also know that it says that there is one body in verse 4. There's one spirit just also as you were called to one hope of your calling. It says there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You know, you look at verses 4 through 6. As we give our lives to Christ, brethren, we, are to, we need to make sure that, that we are added by God uh, to the body. Because as individuals of God's creation— we have to be added to the body of Christ. And we can only do that if we make Jesus the Lord of our lives. If we publicly, publicly confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, if we're baptized for the remission of our sins, then we understand that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and God, he adds us to the one body, the church. And so it's the one body of the Gentiles and the Jews uh, that are now reconciled unto God, like we learned about earlier in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15. It's the one family of believers in heaven and on earth that we learned about in Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 15. And though we are many, yet we are one, and uh, we form one body in Christ Jesus, just like we learned about in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15. And so, brothers and sisters, what's the point? The essential oneness of God is also reflected in the church. And so we, while we are yet the church, the body of Christ, while we are yet many members, we are to be one body. We are to have the same mind. We are to make sure there's no divisions amongst us um, when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to how we carry out our faith. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves, if there is only one body, why is there so much division in Christianity? Though we are represented in many local congregations, and yet the Scriptures tell us that the universal body of Christ is one body, one church, one faith. For there's one Lord and there's one uh, Spirit. And there's one Father who's over all and in all and, and, and over all. So, brothers and sisters, we are to be one as God is one. If you think about the Godhead and you see, we know that you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
And you see the, the Trinity played out uh, through, throughout the scriptures. And it's, it's made very clear that God is one and three all in the same. Three distinct personalities and yet one God. And for example, we could see how God is, is three, is God is one, and yet working in three different uh, aspects when we think of creation, when we think of the creation story, and when we think of the plan of salvation. For example, in creation, the Father is known to be the designer. We learn about that in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3, 6, 9. And so the Father is the designer. And then we get to the Word, which is meaning the Son that we learn about later in John chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1. We know that the Son, the Word of God, is the Creator, we learn in, the, in John chapter 1. Uh, we know that the Spirit is the organizer of all things, we learn in Genesis chapter 1. But also in uh, Job chapter 26 and verse 13, the Scriptures tell us that by His Spirit, the Spirit of God, He hath garnished, meaning organized, all the heavens. And so all that God had created, the spirits organized. And so we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the Word, if you will, as John would say, all working in harmony to bring about creation as three separate entities, and yet God is one. And so we also see this in salvation. We see this that the Father, he was the designer. The Father was the one who put the plan in place since before the foundation of the world. And then we see the Word, he takes on flesh, becomes the Son of God, and he carries out that plan that God the Father had instituted. We learn about that in various places through Scripture. And then we have the Holy Spirit, who is the, the revealer and the power behind the plan of salvation. Because in John 14 and in John 16, we see that the Holy Spirit is the one that Jesus was going to send in order to bring about their remembrance of everything that Jesus ever said and did. And to bring about all that the Father, uh, all that the Father willed, and the Holy Spirit didn't speak according to His own will; He spoke exactly as He was told. And so we know that the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Word, working together, created all things in creation and brought together the plan of salvation that we see and that saves us, uh, that we enter into, and that and, and that we enter into. And so, likewise, think about the church now. In regards to creation and salvation, I showed you three in one. And now I want you to think about the church for a minute, the body of Christ. We know that we are many members, and yet we are, we are to function as one body. And we are to work together to fulfill the very purpose that God has given us. For our purpose is to seek out brothers and sisters and save the lost souls of this world by teaching others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. While we continue to do the good works, and making disciples, we also know that the scriptures teach us that there will be problems that come about in the church. And so while we understand that there's going to be problems that arise within the church, the brotherhood, we also need to understand that the challenge is to deal with those problems and overcome those problems while maintaining love and unity. Not uh, compromising, and I'm not talking about compromising or contradicting God's word, but when the problems come into the church, when the problems enter into the brotherhood, we need to make sure we deal with them uh, with, a, with an, a mindset, an attitude of love and in unity. That's why in verse 3 it said that we are to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Brothers and sisters, we need to make sure and we need to understand that the leaders and members of the church, they must be able to distinguish between matters of doctrine and matters of opinion. There have been way too many people who have, who have left the, the Lord's church, who have left the body of Christ over matters of opinion. This has happened in almost all congregations that I know of. And when this happens, it shows a lack of spiritual maturity and a, 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 a lack of, of humility on the parts of the individuals who decide to leave over matters of opinion. Brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we carry ourselves in a spirit uh, in, a, in, a, in a manner that is worthy of our calling, humbling ourselves, having meekness as part of our mindset and our, and our personality, uh, making sure that we do all things to the glory of the Father. And when it comes to matters of opinion, making sure that while we make our, our thoughts known, that we always make sure that we allow the leaders of the congregations, the shepherds, the elders, to make sure that they're leading uh, without having to... to have regrets or to have anguish uh, as they lead the church because of the matters of opinion. You see, brothers and sisters, their job, first and foremost, is to lead everybody to 
uh, into the doctrine of Jesus Christ to make sure that we're teaching things that are true and that are, that are, and that are not according to the ways of the world, but are according to the ways of God. Their first and foremost job is to protect the church and to guide us in the word of God. And that's what a shepherd does. A shepherd feeds the flock. And it's talking about spiritually uh, feeding the flock. A shepherd is to protect the flock, spiritually protect the flock through the word of God by raising up a, a congregation of people who are able to understand truth from error. Uh, people who are able to, uh, to recognize uh, uh, matters of opinion from matters of doctrine. And so as we continue to, uh, to, to be submissive in our, in our role, as, as fellow Christians, as, as many members of one body, we give, uh, we give submission over, uh, and we put ourselves in the submission to the leaders, the elders of the congregation. And then we get to verse 7 and following, and it says this, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, and so that he might fill all things. Brothers and sisters, when you look at verses 7 through 10 there, when Christ ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. We see that in, in, uh, in Ephesians. We see that uh, uh, in the book of Romans. We see that uh, in 1 Corinthians. And I think about John chapter 16 and verse 7. Notice what it says in John 16 and 7. It says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And what was the point of God, uh, of Jesus, sending the helper, the Holy Spirit, to his disciples after he ascended back on high? Because he was going to give them the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit was going to work through them. And it was going to bring about the confirmation of the word that the Holy Spirit was going to guide them. In. And it was the, the word that Jesus had received from the Father that we learn about in John chapter 12 in verses, say, 46 through 50. And Jesus said, I didn't come to uh, condemn the world, but to save the world. But you have one that judges you. The words in which I speak is what will judge you in the last day. And Jesus teaches us in that John chapter 12 that I didn't speak on my own initiative, but I spoke exactly as the Father had commanded me because I know his words contain eternal life. And then so we get to John 16 and 7. This is by telling you the truth, it is to your advantage, he's telling his disciples that I go away. And then you think about Mark 16. And you get to Mark 16 on your screen there, and you look at verse 16 through 19. Notice what it says there. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed, in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. You think about John chapter 16 that we read a moment ago. And Jesus told them, it is to your benefit that I go. And now we see here that Jesus in the Gospel of Mark was telling his disciples exactly what they could expect, that not only are they to go out into the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey all things that God had commanded them, baptizing them people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he says you can expect to see these signs working through them. And the signs are the what's laid out there in verse 17 and 18, because those signs is what gives confirmation to the message that the Holy Spirit was guiding the first century men in. And Jesus, brothers and sisters, he left heaven. He left heaven to become a man, to take on flesh. And Paul mentioned the fact that Christ has ascended. Christ made a round trip. Uh, he made a round trip uh, ticket, so to speak. Uh, if, if you think about his journey, uh, giving up the glory that he had with the Father since before the foundation of the world, to take on flesh that we learn about in 1 John uh, in chapter 1, and then he takes on flesh. He lives a, a perfect, sinless life. He gives up his life. He's sacrificed. He raises, he, he's raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit on the third day. And then after that, he, he, he goes on to uh, make himself known to over 500 individuals. And then he ascends back into heaven. Brothers and sisters, and the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit gives the, the brothers and sisters the uh, the ability to do amazing things. 
for all that the Holy Spirit was working through. And so therefore, Christ having accomplished his mission, uh, when he uh, descended to the lower parts of the earth where, where, uh, where man lives, has returned to assume the power and the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. And there he occupies the position. Jesus occupies the position of King of Kings. And that's why I said on Sunday, he isn't a future king. He is the king. And he is a, he's not a king that's going to reign in the future as, 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 as a king who's waiting for, uh, for his, his uh, dad to die, so to speak, in order for him to become the king. No. Christ Jesus is the king of all kings, and his kingdom, he reigns now. And he exercises his reign over his people, both in the physical realm as well as in the spiritual realm. Brothers and sisters, notice what it says now in verse 11 through 13. And he gave some as apostles. It says he gave some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, for, eat, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. It says, until we all attain the unity of the faith. You see what it says there, brethren. Until Christ returns, it says in verse 13, that he gives uh, apostles, he has given prophets, he has given evangelists, he has given pastors and teachers. Why? In verse 12, the beginning of verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, which is the church. Until what? In verse 13, until we attain the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Brothers and sisters, we make sure, make sure that we uh, never forget that the body of Christ is comprised of many different people who form that one church who form the one body, the body of Christ. And we are all a, a part of a body, and we are all to perform various tasks to bring about the very fulfillment of the purpose that God has given us as a collective whole, many members as one body. We have been given a purpose, and we are to use our talents and our gifts that God has blessed us with to the fulfillment of the purpose of the church, to the fulfillment of the purpose of the kingdom of God, which is for us to seek and save lost souls, and to continue to seek and save lost souls, to continue to show the love of Christ, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling with humility and meekness uh, and love. And brethren, if we do that, well, then we'll be people, we'll be a people who are growing spiritually uh, and maturing spiritually. And we'll be a people that other people are going to want to know more about. They're going to want to know more about our Jesus because they see the changes that have been made in their friends who, and their family members who have become children of God, who have become disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we need to be people who grow spirit to, to spiritual maturity. And the way we grow to spiritual maturity is through study and is through the service that we perform, not only in the church, but also uh, in society, by utilizing the talents, brothers and sisters, that God has blessed us with. And so we're going to pause it right there, and we're going to pick up on this idea because there's a lot more that needs to be said. And we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 next week in conjunction with these things that we're learning here. So uh, we think about and we can learn about the various gifts that God through the Holy Spirit was giving to those in the church in order to bring about uh, God's will for the kingdom of God. So brothers and sisters, we'll end the study here tonight. Let us go to God in prayer and then we'll be done. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, Father God, and we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had here to come together via Zoom, uh, via technology, to study your word here tonight. I pray that our hearts and minds uh, were focused on you. I pray that, uh, that uh, Father, we set aside the cares and the troubles of the world long enough to, 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 to glean something new from this lesson. And I just pray, Father God, that we don't uh, keep this message to ourselves, but that we take this message out into the world uh, the, the, all the good news message, Father, that we could seek and save lost souls. We could let people know about the love, the joy, the comfort that comes from being a child of yours. And so, Father God, there are many of us in, in, in the Lord's church uh, who are hurting at this time. Uh, we have uh, many, uh, many uh, blessings are needed, whether it be spiritually speaking, uh, physically, emotionally, financially. There are many uh, various members who are hurting, Father God, and and we know that you know their needs before we even ask. And we just pray a special blessing on them. I think of uh, our sister, Sherry Boucho, who was uh, taken to the hospital this morning. Uh, she's going to be having some various tests uh, run on her tomorrow and maybe the day after. And we just pray, Father God, that, uh, that, uh, that you be with the medical doctors and the medical staff that are treating her. 
We pray, Father God, for them to do the job to the best of their ability, and we pray that you guide them in all that they do. We pray that you bless her for her health and strength to be restored, and we pray that you be with Roger as he's worried about his, his, uh, his beautiful wife, Sherry. And so, Father God, we pray for all those uh, who are in need, um, and that we have many that are on our prayer list at Lincoln Park, and we pray your, pray your blessings upon them. It's in Christ's name we pray and ask for all things, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.